Today is the sixth Sunday of the Holy 15, and today we speak about our victory in Christ. In this famous, at the end of the, at the end of the gospel today, we read from St. John chapter 16, verses 23 to 33. And in verse 33, we hear, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we see the victory in Christ. Last Thursday, we celebrated a major feast, the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the ascension of Christ does something amazing. His ascension completes the unification of God and man. It brings our human nature up to the divine kingdom. Something amazing happens. And then we read in the, in the, in the ascension in the book of Acts that we find our Lord Jesus Christ, we see his ascension was not the end. It was basically the beginning of the church, a new beginning for the apostles as well. On Sunday, a week from today, next Sunday, uh, we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And as a reminder, there's no Sunday school that day because we have the prostration prayers um, immediately following. And so something happens between the Ascension Feast and the Pentecost Feast. This is kind of this 10-day period that we're in, right? The Bible explains a couple of things to us about this 10-day period. What do the disciples and the apostles do after the Ascension? Well, they have just witnessed this amazing event. Almost as miraculous as the resurrection was his ascension. I mean, can you imagine standing there with your mouths open while this, this man, Christ, levitates in front of you and he starts going up. He's talking to you and he's blessing you and then he's taking out of sight. He disappears. How long would you stand there and stare up and look at the sky and just look at each other like, did that just really happen? And then you turn and you look, and then there's these two men in white robes standing there saying, you know, hello. <laughs> like, where did you come from? And, and they're probably angels. And they said, why do you just stand there gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus that was taken up from you in heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him leave. And so once again, in the gospel, St. Luke says that they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So the first thing after the ascension was they stood there with their mouths open. The second thing is that they worshipped him, and they returned back to Jerusalem with great joy. Our Lord told them not to leave Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit arrived. And so they were in Bethany, about a mile and a half away from Jerusalem. And so even though he was gone, they were still obedient to Christ, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they spent the next 10 days in the upper room and the temple praising God. The Bible is very clear about this. But then there's this like other aspect of these 10 days that hopefully we, we contemplate on. At the ascension, that's when Christ in his physical body tells us goodbye. He leaves us and he departs from us and we don't see him anymore. And his disciples were looking up into the clouds, and he was taken up from them, and they couldn't see him anymore. How many times have we longed to see Christ? Yes, I believe in Christ. Yes, I, I want to see him. I want to talk to him. I want to hear the voice of Christ. When he ascended into the heavens, that voice was taken away. That physical presence was taken away. Now the question at this point, is he out of sight, out of mind? I hope not. Thankfully, in our liturgy, we have many other things that call us to remember the presence of Christ in our lives. Our Lord in his physical, human, resurrected, glorified, tangible, physical body walked around amongst his disciples for 40 days after he rose from the dead. And then he was taken away, and they could no longer see him. Now, our Lord talks to his disciples in this passage from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. And he's talking very directly, very plainly to them. He says to his disciples, now you are speaking plainly. Sorry, his disciples said, now you are speaking plainly, not in a proverb, right? Now we know that you know all things and need none to question you. 
By this we believe that you came from God. Now our Lord asks a very sobering question in verse 31. He says, do you now believe? It's almost like he's saying, really? Are you sure? Are you sure that you believe? Because the time is coming where I'm going to be taken away from you. I'm going to leave you. And you all are going to be scattered. As long as I am physically here in your presence, and you can see me, and you can touch me, and you can hear me, it's easy for you to say that you believe. But what happens when you don't see me anymore? It reminds me in the verse, says elsewhere in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, where Christ says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? So I don't want to end up on the wrong side of that question. I don't want Christ to be out of sight and out of mind. After our Lord spoke these words in the Gospel of St. John, we see a sort of manifestation of it. Because Christ was taken from their midst twice. First, we know, he was brutally murdered. He was crucified. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. And the stone is rolled from the face of the tomb, and Christ can be seen no longer. So the disciples that had fervently and sincerely pledged their belief and their faith scattered, nowhere to be found. They went to hiding. And then the apostle St. Peter, when faced with this question, do you know Christ? He swore and he declared, I don't know the man. And then our Lord is gloriously resurrected. And they get to see proof of who he is more tangibly and more impressively than they had seen in the entire three years that they walked with him. For now, he was not only raised, he not only raised other people from the dead, but he, he raised himself. He not only healed other people, but he's the one who conquers. He's the one who conquers the wind and the waves. He is the one who not only just multiplies loaves and fish, but he has gone to the grave and, to, and lived to tell about it. He himself has conquered death. He doesn't just merely resuscitate his body and die again, as happened to Lazarus. No, he is the first man and the new creation with a body, a new body, a resurrected physical body that never, that will never die eternally and his disciples see him and they touch him and they eat with him and they walk with him and they talk with him and then 40 days later at the ascension last thursday he was taken away from them again so the question comes will he be out of sight and out of mind now in this case they were so impressed by what they had seen and experienced i don't think that he was out of mind this is different. I don't think they could ever get that image out of their mind. They had touched and seen and heard the resurrected Lord. I don't think they can get that out of their hearts. I don't think they can lose their faith at this point. And yet, even though their mind was convinced and their heart was convinced and full of faith, they were still not ready to go out and evangelize. Not yet. There was one thing missing. So for 10 days between the ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit in Pentecost, they were still in hiding. What did our Lord tell them? He told them ahead of time. He said, wait until you are endowed with the power from on high. This is from Luke chapter 24, verse 49. So often we think that it's enough to have the faith up in our heads. Like we mentally get it. We mentally believe that it's true. And in our hearts, we have this faith, this passion, this emotional belief that, yes, I am convicted. I know this is true. But one thing still remains that we need. We need the mind. We need the heart. But we also need to be endowed from the power from on high. The Holy Spirit literally fills us. God himself energizes us. This is why baptism and chrismation is not an optional thing. This is the one thing that they still lacked, even when they had the mental knowledge and even that they had faith in their hearts. This is why 
our Lord said, It is better for you that I go away. For if I don't, do not go away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go away, then I will send another Comforter, and he will be in you, and he will fill you. Our personal Pentecost comes and happens at our chrismation. Most of us in this room have been chrismated, and we have been given this power. We have been plugged in. But, you know, we can still have a coffee pot or like a vacuum cleaner plugged in to a perfectly good outlet, but you still have to flip the switch on. Some of us, through chrismation, have been plugged in. We have that power from on high, but sometimes our switch is off. We need to flip it back on. You see, this command that's given from St. Paul in Ephesians and to the Colossians, who have already been baptized, who had already been filled with the Holy Spirit, what does St. Paul say? He said, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is the joy that goes along with being filled with the Holy Spirit. If it was just a one-time thing, that guaranteed perfection for the rest of your life, then why would St. Paul give this command? Yes, you need that initial plugging in. You need the hands being laid on you. You need to be chrismated. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But for the rest of your life, it is a matter of choice. It's a matter of submission to God. It's a matter of holiness and loving Christ. So how do we love Christ? By keeping his commandments. Living that life of, of piety, of discipline, of holiness, of focus. That says, I'm not just plugged into the outlet, but I'm turned on. And the volume is turned up to the maximum. We have been given a great and wonderful gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, God himself living and dwelling in us, united in us. And the scripture, but this energy, this power from on high operates within the context of holiness and Christ-likeness. The scripture says that it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit and commands us, don't do that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, for that which is a great gift is also a great responsibility. So to conclude, our Lord asks us, just because you don't see me, do you still believe? Is your mind convinced or is it out of sight, out of mind? One of the best things that we can do is not step on our own toes not getting our own ways and defeating ourselves. If you don't want Christ to be out of sight and out of mind, then always keep him in sight. It's as simple as that. Put icons in the house. Put icons where you are going to be interacting with them constantly. Be strategic. Pray daily. It's not optional. Read scripture. Wear crosses. Watch and listen to things and have conversations that lift Christ up. Allow Christ to always have a place in our hearts and our eyes in front of him. Don't allow the possibility to come for him to be out of sight and out of mind. Don't go to places where you think it's unsuitable for Christ to go. Then why would you go? Make sure that it's not just this mental thing but that your heart is aflame with the light of Christ. Most importantly, don't stop with the mind and the heart, but be sure that through a life of holiness and through your life of prayer, that on a daily basis, you are not only plugged in to the Holy Spirit, but that you have the, the switch flipped on and that you are living in that reality. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Alleluia, Alleluia.